Well, what we can actually bring you now are exclusive images which we've just received from Maxar on the situation at Kabul International Airport and the huge crowds over there earlier on in the day. So these are images from Maxar. You can actually take a look at these crowds over here if we actually zoom into these images. If we can actually zoom in over there, this is at maximum zoom. But all of these massive crowds, uh, as you can see, in this entire area, in this entire area, uh, all around the aircraft, people desperate to try and go in. We're going to move now, try and bring you another image over here. And as you can see over here, I'm just trying to see if we can zoom any further. All right. If you point at this, if you look at this particular area, right along the taxiway or perhaps the runway itself, if we can just zoom in into this particular area, these brown dots that you actually see on your screen in this entire area are actually hundreds of people who are milling in around this entire area and also uh, on the runway itself. This is full of people, all of this people on the ground on the runway. All right, let's uh, take a look now at another zoomed in image. And this is what I'm talking about over here. This is actually much clearer. You can actually see all of these people over here on the runway, desperate to get onto an aircraft. Many of them were trying to actually get on to aircraft. Some did and some perished. They fell down after the aircraft took, uh, took off. Security vehicles over here, but obviously these security vehicles not enough and people on the runway as you can see people on the runway uh, as you can see in this uh, entire area and finally this is the situation outside the entrance to the airport absolutely crazy scenes traffic jams massive as people try to get uh, out of kabul uh, earlier on today and a final image that we can try and show you uh, of another area possibly people had to walk a large distance uh, and vehicles stuck over there as they tried to get into Kabul International Airport, an absolutely desperate situation. Now, the point that is often not reported enough is this. India's interest in Afghanistan is actually directly linked, India's interest in Afghanistan directly linked to a lot of investment projects. Let's give you a couple of ideas. Now, 34 of Afghanistan's provinces have uh, an Indian involvement. The 42 megawatt Salma Dam in the Herat province, the 218 kilometer long Zaran's Delaram Highway built by the Border Roads Organization, the Afghan parliament in Kabul built by India at a whopping cost of $90 million, a tripartite agreement for restoration of uh, the store palace in Kabul, a 220 kilowatt DC transmission line from Pule Kumri to the north of Kabul. Indian contractors and workers have restored telecommunications infrastructure in many provinces of Afghanistan. India has reconstructed a children's hospital it had helped build in Kabul in 1972. We've gifted 400 buses, 200 minibuses for urban transportation, 105 utility vehicles for municipalities, 285 military vehicles for the army. India has contributed desks for schools. We built solar panels in remote villages. We've sent 75,000 tons of wheat to strengthen food security during the pandemic. We've signed an agreement for the construction of the Shatut Dam in the Kabul district and have pledged $1 million for another Aga Khan heritage project. India-Afghanistan true trade grew with the establishment of an air freight corridor. The External Affairs, uh, Affairs Ministry says India's development portfolio in Afghanistan mounts to over 3 billion US dollars. So that's what you have uh, actually in terms uh, of the situation of India and our contribution to Afghanistan, which is why this discussion becomes so important. So what's going to happen now? Will Pakistan and China seamlessly fill the chasm which has opened up in Afghanistan? What are the implications of this for us? Joining us, Nishta Satyam, the Deputy Country Representative of UN Women India. Uh, Jonah Blank joins us. Uh, he has written extensively about this area. Pam Pamela Constable, um, one of the most experienced journalists I've had the pleasure of working with on assignment every now and again. Ajay Shukla, the defense analyst with us as well, had covered the Afghanistan war with Ajay many, many years back, 20 years. It's changed, hasn't it? And Abdul Basit, the former High Commissioner of Pakistan to India. Um, let me go across to you first, Pamela. The United States, in very small numbers, is still in Kabul International Airport. And there is a sense that as long as they are there, evacuations can take place. Is it your feeling that the moment that the last 
of these American soldiers leave, then we would see that scenario which we are really worried about, a potential bloodbath in Kabul. Of course, it's impossible to predict. The Taliban officials keep saying that they want law and order, they want to prevent looting and violence, that they, that they want to restore security to the capital. That's what their officials and their spokespeople keep saying. However, as the situation at the airport gets further and further out of control, it's likely that things will not be able to stay uh, at all in, in control. And the Taliban, in what they've been doing in rural areas where they're in control is they've been promising services, they've been promising security, uh, but when things go wrong, then they resort to intimidation and, and sometimes uh, worse violence. So I don't think that the Taliban at this point intend for there to be chaos and, and, and catastrophe in Kabul, but, but they too may get overwhelmed. And you've got this proximity of Taliban guards and American soldiers very close to each other. Um, it's, it's a recipe for disaster, and um, we can only hope that the, the worst doesn't come. If you have people falling off military planes, um, that's terrible enough. I, I yep. can't imagine that these two, two sides are going to cooperate in any way, but if there's, if there's a chance for a lessening of, of the violence, I don't think it would behoove either the new um, emirate uh, or the Americans or, or any Afghans um, for it to get worse. Yep. Abdul Qadir is a student. Uh, he uh, lives over here, an Afghan national who lives here in Delhi. Abdul, uh, have you been able to get through to your, to your friends and, and family and loved ones? What is the situation in Afghanistan? Yes, you know that you better that Afghanistan is very bad. Tomorrow, Kabul will be in Kabul. We will be in Herat. We will be in हालत बहुत बुरा है नहीं तो आप रिश्तेदार कहां रहते काबुल में रहते या और कहीं और कहीं रहते हेरात के हेरात के और हेरात का कंडीशन बहुत ही खराब है इस वक्त तो आपके रिश्तेदार आपके फैमिली को क्या कहना है हेरात का कंडीशन इस वक्त क्या है हालत बहुत खराब है मैं सुबह से बात किया सिस्टर के उसने बोला कि हम डर लगेगा बाहर नहीं जाना हूं हम हमारा बेटा का बाहर जाना है उसका खाना पीना का लेना है उसका बहुत हालत खराब है उसका हम डर लगेगा बाहर से नहीं जाना हूं वो उसका वीडियो देखा है अभी हमारे पास एक तस्वीर है वो तस्वीर ये है कि तीन दो दिन के पहले लड़का का दो लड़का का मिन रोड के उसे गर्दन तालिबान काट किया अगर आपका इजाजत देना है मैं आपको वो दिखा दूं नहीं 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 बट ये बताइए ये बताइए आपके फैमिली इस वक्त ठीक है इस वक्त अभी फिलहाल हमारा पापा गया ईरान से जी लेकिन हमारा ठीक है लेकिन घर पे 24 घंटा का आपका का कोई आईडिया इस बात नहीं होगा बाहर कैसे जाऊंगे अपना घर कब जा पाए इस इसमें तो शायद इसमें सब सबसे ज्यादा मुसीबत आपको इस बात पे हो रहा है कि अब वापस कब जाएंगे आपका कोई आईडिया नहीं है अभी कोई आईडिया नहीं है हम बिल्कुल नहीं सोचा कि क्या करूं क्योंकि हमारा का जान का खतरा है उसका जान का खतरा है वो कब आ रही है हमारा पास अगर दुसमुर जाना है वो चीज का भी कोई आईडिया नहीं है अब्दुल कादिर ये 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 हमारा इंडिया हमारा हिंदुस्तान आपका घर है आप यहां सेफ हो एक एक यो वेलकम इन आवर कंट्री एंड एंड यू नो एंड 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 होप एंड वी आर वी आर होपफुल दैट यू विल बी सेफ ओवर हियर एंबेसडर अब्दुल बासित थैंक्स वेरी मच फॉर बीइंग विद अस एंबेसडर बासित द you know, there was a statement made by uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan, which I couldn't understand. He suggested that the Taliban that uh, have broken the chains of slavery in Afghanistan. What, 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 why would he suggest something like that? I have no idea. Uh, I'm, I'm not Abdul Qadir Ji, one minute. Uh, Ambassador Basit, go ahead. A, I'm not as a spokesperson, but obviously uh, Pakistan has been trying for the last so many years uh, to uh, bring about reconciliation in Afghanistan, but unfortunately, uh, our efforts uh, could not uh, uh, realize success. And then, all of a sudden, we have seen that Americans enter into an agreement with the Taliban uh, and then uh, leave uh, Afghanistan uh, rather uh, in haste. 
So, uh, but I do not know. isn't this a big victory for your country? The fact it's that the good. Taliban have been supported at every level by Pakistan. You've got a prime minister who said the Taliban have broken the chains of slavery in Afghanistan. Is this so not I a, not a moment of I victory, do, I, sir, for I, Pakistan? I really do not know what was the context of the statement. But uh, in Pakistan, obviously, we are still very careful. Even today, there is a delegation visiting from Afghanistan of non-Taliban leaders, and we are still trying to promote reconciliation. Uh, no, I can understand uh, uh, why India is angry, uh, is rattled. Uh, there are a number of variety of reasons. You mentioned about uh, your development assistance to Afghanistan. Pakistan, too, has invested close to $500 million in the last 10-15 uh, years. We have also contributed enormously to the development of infrastructure and, and so on. And facilitated the so movement forth. of the Taliban. But not really, but you, know, you also kind of stoked fissures among Afghan, Afghan people. Now, let's be honest about it. You invested in national security direct trade to use Afghanistan territory to destabilize Pakistan. But at the end of the day, really? you also tried to reach out to the Taliban. But Taliban rejected your offer. They, they All right, well, that's not entirely correct. I think India reaching out to the Afghanistan is a process that started just now. Ajay Shukla, I think uh, the larger issue for India is this. We have obviously lots of problems with Pakistan, historic problems. We have a major issue with China and now we've got a problem in Afghanistan, which till 48 hours back was one of our closest allies. Uh, in a situation, what are the implications of this situation for India? Oh, well, Vishnu, the implications are actually very clear. There's little that India can do about China, the ongoing situation on the border with China. There's little India can do with Pakistan except for ensuring that the ceasefire continues to hold and the situation remains somewhat calm. Uh, but where we actually have some leverage and where we can do something useful is in an establishing a relationship, a diplomatic relationship, a security relationship with the new rulers of Afghanistan, which is the Taliban. Now, uh, it is, it is a, the a reflexive action of most Indians to say, how can we talk to the Taliban? They're a terrorist group. But they, whatever group they are, they are in power in Afghanistan. And if we want to have any leverage at all, if we want to be able to oversee the projects that you listed out absolutely correctly, uh, we have to have some sort of relationship going with the Taliban. Now, uh, it is my personal opinion, having spoken to numerous Taliban leaders, that they do not act obediently at the behest of Pakistan. The Taliban is an Afghan nationalist group, and they do not sort of like, they, in fact, they actively resent Pakistani domination over them, um, which sort of seems to continue to be there at this point in time, but which could well be shaken off by the Taliban in the days ahead. So I think India needs to be very careful, very watchful, keep an eye open for opportunities in Afghanistan. And when the time comes, don't hesitate to talk and outreach to the Taliban. Okay. Uh, Jonah Blank, uh, the American uh, decision to actually withdraw from Afghanistan in this manner, it's, it's, it's truly astounding. Why would President Biden choose to exit Afghanistan at the pace at which America did? Was he misled completely by his advisors? Well, first, I would just like to say to uh, Abdul Qadir and to uh, everyone in Afghanistan how sorry I am uh, for the tragedy that is unfolding, particularly um, Abdul Qadir's family in Harat. I, I'm just heartbroken. Uh, the first time that I went to Harat was in August of 2002, right after the Taliban fell. So. Uh, the, the prospect of such a beautiful city with such lively people coming under Taliban rule is just heartbreaking and multiply that across the whole country. Now to your question, uh, why uh, was the withdrawal handled this way? Um, I certainly do not think that this was handled in any way correctly. Uh, and I don't think a case could be made that it was. Why? Well, the best I can say is that um, I don't know anybody who really predicted that the Taliban would move into to to Kabul as quickly as they did. I think that we should have predicted it. And when I say we, I mean every analyst, because I've been out of government for over a decade now. But 
Uh, this took everyone by surprise, and we all have to ask ourselves why, because yes, the U.S. government certainly failed, uh, but I think uh, I certainly, as an outside analyst, failed too, and most of the analysts I know did. Yeah. Um, Nishta, one of the, the biggest areas where we've seen remarkable progress in Afghanistan in two decades, the rights of women, uh, women teachers, uh, women professionals, women MPs, uh, and yet there was this horrific tweet I read yesterday where women going to university in Herat, where approximately 60% of women in Herat were women, were told, go back. There's no place for you anymore. Go home. What does this mean for women in Afghanistan? Thank you, Vishnu. It's actually heartbreaking. Uh, uh, to, to hear the voices of women from Afghanistan. Uh, I saw, in fact, a post today which said this is going to take Afghanistan back by 200 years. It's also a reiterating moment for us to see how quickly uh, the gains made on women's rights can be reversed. Uh, it's also important for us to see why it is important for women to be at the negotiating table. Today, we are really talking about uh, the Taliban upholding the rights of women or a new promise, really. Uh, but to, but the, ma the major question here is, what is that rooted in? Is it rooted in women's voices? Who is at the table negotiating for them? Who represents these women? So we actually see uh, so many women, their lives, the choices that they have made, the struggles that they have put, for, put forward for more than really three to four decades uh, being drawn into, again, a black spot. Uh, this is also not the time for international organizations, for neighbors, for people, uh, uh, and for civility in general to look away, particularly on the issue of women's rights, because, of course, at the same time, we must remind ourselves that these negotiations, these, this advocacy uh, may have an unintended consequence on women living in the country. Right. Uh, so it has to be done with a certain amount uh, of care, uh, empathy and love. And, and hopefully the international community will come together and uphold its responsibility at a time like this. Well, at this stage, the international community appears entirely lost. Let's hope that there is some trajectory towards peace. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us.